this week we've got a real treat. Um, uh, our speaker is, is Karen McLean from the University of British Columbia. I've known uh, Karen for, for many years. We were graduate students uh, together uh, back in the 90s um, at, at MIT. And um, at the time, I uh, didn't know what the word hafting meant. And I'm not sure that you did either. Right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was starting to be discovered. Um, uh, Karen told me an interesting anecdote last night at dinner, which was that when she was hired, into the uh, Department of Computer Science at University of British Columbia. Uh, they asked her to come and develop a curriculum in uh, HCI, and she didn't know what HCI meant. Um, but it turns out that she's really the person, I think, more so than any who's uh, put the haptic in HCI, because isn't it haptic computer? Anyway, um, so uh, she's um, indeed one of the, the, the leading thinkers on uh, the use of, of haptics in human computer interaction uh, in the world. and. Um, uh, uh, it's been a, a great pleasure to have uh, really to interact with her through the years, and uh, um, uh, one uh, aspect of that is a, uh, a paper that uh, she's uh, uh, written for the new uh, IEEE Transactions and Haptics. Uh, the second issue comes out next month, and it will feature a, a, a survey paper on her work in that area, and I'm very excited that uh, we're having the opportunity to publish it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to hand it over to uh, Karen, and looking very much forward to it. Thanks very much. Uh, so Ed also told me last night that the audience would be a mix of design and engineering students, or design engineering students. That looks like it's mostly the case. That's great. And with a few faculty smattered in. So based on that, I adjusted my talk just a little bit to, uh, to, to suit that audience, uh, as opposed to being a, just a pure research talk. And I hope what I'm going to try and convey is some of the design aspects of the work that I've done, and maybe how it's different than other haptic work. Because uh, Ed is here, I know that you guys are going to be much more informed about the field of haptics and haptic design than most of my most, most of the audiences that we generally go out and talk to are. So that's a really great starting point. However, the haptics that I do look a little different than the haptics that Ed, Ed does. So I uh, just want to start off with the usual smattering of pictures of some of the things that we do with our sense of touch in the real world. And not to dwell on it too much, but you can see a lot of different things going on here when we're touching real things. There's uh, skilled tool use. There's expressive interfaces where it's very hard to play a keyboard or any kind of an acoustic instrument without the, the dynamics, the interaction of the field that's going on. There's the, the affect, there's things that look nice, things that make you reach out and want to touch them because the way they look and the way they're going to feel in your hand. There's a very strong emotional component to our sense of touch. Uh, things that are very hard to ever imagine being able to render well with direct finger contact, something like, like a, a sheet of silk or, or fabric. Uh, and, and there's a lot of emotional communication between people, between uh, not, not just between people, but also in the things that we touch. And so these are, there's this really rich aspect of touch in the real world, and of course, uh, this is really what we have in the HCI world right now, the human computer interaction where we're actually trying to make interfaces and inter in, uh, connections between the humans and the computation, mostly still does this. I mean, we're trying to do a little bit better and there's different things going on and of course there's, there's haptic interfaces uh, that are trying to go out after this in a fairly, uh, in a desktop way mostly. And so, so the question is how can haptics help and actually bring these two worlds together in, in, in what are the special ways that haptics is going to be able to help that so, and, and restore some of that tangibility that we have in the real world. So and this is a little, a little uh, extra thing that I put in last night after talking to, to Ed. And so one thing, so Ed referred to, um, should I be calling him Dr. Colgan? It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I heard a few people referring, we go by first name basis in my department at home. Um, so we came from the biomechanics lab at MIT, and that was a, uh, that was a real uh, hotbed of where haptics research started. There was a lot that came out of there, and I think it was typical of other places that haptic has produced a lot of great haptics research. And there's really two big sources of it. There it came out of robotics engineering, telerobotics, and rehabilitation engineering. There was a lot of really great innovations that happened from that field. And it also came from the area of psychology, where people were studying the sense of touch on the human side. Okay. And there was also some great interactions that have been happening more recently, well, in the last 10 years, I would say, where more and more the hardware designers have been building devices to help inform answering psychological questions. 
But if you see something that's really missing from this list, it's where is where, where, where what's actually inspiring the creation of these designs? Is it it's building neat devices, but it's not always to make, perhaps from my view not enough of actually solving human needs. And so there's a term for this in the HCI. It's called techno-centered design. Now, and I won't say that it's exclusively happening, but I would say it was more a domineering influence here, where you have these really talented engineers building these amazing devices, and then often not being so sure what to do with them or searching for applications for what you can do with the devices. And so now I'll go off on a little tangent. I have a sort of a, a, a weird background. So I was training in MIT mechanical engineering, hardcore techno um, Engineering is good, everything else you have to think twice about. Okay, but I actually noticed that haptics, because I got, I got put on the problem of solving haptics problem, and well, it has a human side to it. There's people involved in it. It's not just, it's not just robots. And uh, so it became obvious in my particular PhD research that I was going to have to do user studies. It just didn't make any sense not to, but no one was really doing the kind of user studies that I needed to do, and so I had to teach myself. I'm not saying they weren't happening somewhere, but they weren't happening where I was. And then after I graduated, I went to work for a funny company in Palo Alto. It's called Interval Research. It was a very eclectic collection of people doing lots of different things, but I was a minority as an engineer there. And uh, I heard the word ethnography for the first time, and it really was the first time, and it wasn't meant in a derogatory way. And I, I found myself doing things that I would have, I, I was actually literally concerned that my old colleagues at MIT would find out because they might laugh at me about it. Because I, I went and worked on an art project at the Royal College of Art in my first, did I ever tell you that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we called it hot and sweaty. <laughs> the thing we made. We were, we were trying to explore multiple dimensions of touch and it was a kind of an art project, a design with a capital D. And it was really fun, but I, I wasn't going to talk about it at MIT <laughs> because I wasn't well established enough. I don't think my reputation could stand up to it. Um, but when I was there, I, I really got uh, this mindset that the people there were very focused on studying real human needs and trying to figure out if there's something they could do to solve those needs. They're trying to make money. I mean, they were really looking for a way to make a product, but instead of saying, here's a great technology, can we find a use for it, they were saying, uh, okay, here's some people, they have problems now, let's go out and look and see what kind of technologies we might be able to bring to bear on this problem. Which was a quite different approach than I had encountered before. And then, uh, four years later, I had this experience where I was invited to interview for my present job, and I was told that they needed me to create an HCI curriculum, and I really wasn't sure what HCI meant. And it was a bit scary to be asked to start a curriculum in something that I didn't know what it meant. But... Uh, the thing was that I found out pretty soon that I did know what HCI was and I just had a different name for it. And so, at Interval, I had a team of about eight, eight people from a very multidisciplinary term that was, were working on this. We were working, trying to build things that people would actually use. We were struggling with this problem and we often uh, had setbacks in it. It became clear when we weren't so sure we were succeeding that we didn't have enough information on how, we were doing pretty well on the technological side, but we weren't doing well enough on the human side. We didn't know enough about what people were actually feeling, what sensations they were getting. How were they learning? How, how hard was it for them to learn? How much effort was involved in learning <coughs> these things we were trying to ask them to feel when there was learning involved? What would make it easier for them to learn? How were they interpreting? What did these things we were throwing at them mean to them? Uh, what did they feel about it? Did they like it? Did they not like it? How would we know? Was it good for them to like it? Was it bad for them to like it? All these things turned out were very important when you're trying to make things that are going to be usable. And you guys who have Don Norman here probably appreciate that even more than a lot of people because that's an uh, uh, ethic that he promotes, I know. But, uh, but we didn't know how to study it for haptics and it's not something that had been looked at a lot for haptics. And I started to realize at Interval that this was getting in my way. And in an industrial setting, it was hard for me to really study those things, to, to go back, stand back from the product design thing and trying to really get more information about these basics. So that was a very good time for me to move back into academia and start looking at research at a more basic level. So I felt like the human need wasn't <coughs> established well enough, or even when we had an idea of an application that we thought haptics was going to be very well uh, suited for, we, weren't, we didn't have enough knowledge about how people use their sense of touch, or how they could, or what they felt about it, to do a good job of solving those applications. And so, 
anyway, at interval, what we found was that through the course of iteration, the highly iterative design we were doing, is that it started to turn into something that looked a lot like human-centered design, even though I didn't know that initially, and found I was doing this thing that they call HCI. So the one lesson I'll try and say in this, in this thing that's not a lecture is that uh, the human-centered design does happen in a lot of places. It goes by a lot of different names. There are some invariants. Know your users, know their problems. That's something you always have to come back to if you're trying to solve real problems. Design for real needs, and then to go constantly go back to the users and check. And that can be very hard and very expensive. I teach a lot of HCI courses, and I try and teach, keep track of my students when they go out and work at industry. In Vancouver, that usually means the gaming industry or something like that, where HCI is not uh, greatly appreciated, not greatly valued yet. And uh, it's a challenge for them to fit themselves, to shoehorn themselves into the design cycle early enough that they can have those interventions and make that difference. And so there's a, a big aspect to practicing HCI, even, even either as an HCI professional or as part of a design team that has an appreciation of its importance, is, is, uh, is activism and trying, trying to communicate to others the importance of this human-centered approach. Okay, another thing that is really important is that the subjective factors are so, are so critical and we have a big uh, emphasis on measuring performance and saying well this intervention is good because it showed that the performance improved and yet at the same time there's all these much harder, less tangible metrics that have to do with preference and stress, reduced stress, calmness, uh, that, that uh, maybe you don't measure it immediately, but over the course of the day, over the course of the week, it, it, it makes a measurable difference. And so we have to learn how to measure these things more. I believe they are important. And then, like I say, uh, the troubling reality is that doing this in, in whatever medium is expensive, and it's a hard sell at lots of companies. So anyway, that's, that's the, the little bit about design. I'm going to try and take a fairly design-centric focus on what I'm talking about today. I'm going to go through some of my own research projects that involve design, a combination of design and, uh, and psychophysics research. And, oh, last thing, how you change that is for you guys to go out there and, and I'll, I'll do it really well and then people will believe in you. I see pe are people having trouble seeing the bottom of the screen? Okay, I'll try and make sure I read that out. So, so what I'm saying is that this, this attitude of uh, not appreciation, uh, not appreciating human-centric design in industry is only going to change when people like you go out and work in these companies and do it really well, and then it will be more appreciated. And that's our job is to teach you how to do that. Okay, so moving on to these human activities that need to be so supported. So this is a human activity that needs to be supported. This is uh, an interior of a jet airplane. It's fairly challenging to me. There's lots going on in there. Uh, so, so extremely high information, high density displays. This is another challenging environment. Okay, so you're navigating with a cell phone. We're walking down a busy street. Person in the stroller, you're trying not to hit the stroller. You're trying not to get hit by the car. And meanwhile, you're doing something you probably shouldn't be on your cell phone. I don't, I don't have the one of someone driving. I don't actually do that that much. This is another another demanding environment. Different kinds of collaborative environments where you have, there's a teaching scenario that is uh, probably taken from my father's era, uh, a little bit more modern view. But So there's a classroom scenario, there's a boardroom, uh, sorry, a kind of a collaborative work, a boardroom, different, different styles of people getting together and working together. These are all co-located environments. We're also, of course, today very interested in non-co-located environments where some people are local, some people are remote, and you're trying to support the non-verbal cues. And this is another environment that I think haptics can help in, is restoring the non-verbal cues. So all of these environments have in common, there's multiple tasks going on. Whoever is doing something in there is trying to do different stuff at the same time. There's a lot of information around. Some of it is coming through overtly and explicitly. Some of it you're absorbing or would like to be absorbing through your background channels. You're not wanting to explicitly attend to it. Okay, and so there's this concept of foreground and background, and attention plays a very large role in it. And you might be getting the hint by now that I'm very interested in attention and what we do with it and how your senses have something to do with it. And this has a lot to do with the fact that I have been feeling over the last five or ten years extremely, my, my attention seems to be in very limited demand, sorry, limited resource over demand, and I'm getting tired of that. 
Okay, so is there a way that haptics can help with these real human needs? So the particular set of problems that I'm talking about here are busy, multitasking contexts. They have some need of background com communication. Now, what I mean by background communication is that it's, it's not in your face. It's, it's communication that's happening without you having to attend to it explicitly. I'm getting a lot of background information right now by glancing around the room and looking at the attention in your eyes and what you're doing and if you're falling asleep, if you're reading your email. Well, luckily, it's very nice in my apartment. You know, it's got the email out, uh, something you have to contend with in the classroom all the time. But you're making, you're inferring all these things, people walking in and out the door. And yet I'm not paying a lot of attention to it. It's just kind of, you know, floating in my periphery. And that's good. Now if someone raised their hand, that would get my attention. And I, it would draw my attention and I would start paying to that. That would be a movement from the background to the foreground. And that's the kind of thing I want to attend to. But otherwise, I'm getting really important information from this, this background thing. Now, if, I, if you guys, this was an electronic classroom and you guys were not here, you were in in remote places and I couldn't see that, that would make it a lot harder for me to communicate with you, right? So is there some way that we can actually restore that information so that without having it to be a big intrusive screen that requires my conscious attention to come back to? That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. So they need some kind of a haptic language of interaction. Uh, we're going to do something, we might be asking the haptic sense to do something it doesn't naturally do. It's not something we do in the natural world. So we have to remap it in some way. We have to ask it to do something that might be not completely natural, but try and make it seem natural, try and at least be cognitively easy. Okay, so it's an opportunity to meld old and new kinds of touch. And I'm a big fan of uh, Mark Weiser's version of calm technology, which is the idea that technology is working for you instead of getting in your way, and that if we're surrounded by technology, it, it can't be intrusive, because that's not... It's not something that human psyches are built to deal with. And whether human psyches are changing in their ability to deal with that is a different question that I won't get into now. Okay, my lab is called the SPIN Lab, Sensory Perception Interaction. I mainly came up with that acronym because I really like knobs, <laughs> loading or repeating devices that spin around. So, uh, so I'll go through, the, I'm not going to talk about nearly all of this information. Uh, I'm going to touch on a couple of projects, but just to give you the idea, the focus is haptic communication, communicating information of different kinds through the sense of touch. So one thing that I will dwell on a bit today is about haptic icons, which are abstract communication. This is a case where we are trying to ask people to do something that's not completely natural, and trying to see how easy it is for them to do. We're trying to bring a new utility into an old sense and to adapt to our changing environment, and see if we can do that in a very low effort, low cognitive effort way. And so uh, there's design tools, representations that are going to work best, how many can we learn, how the scalability of it, how far can we go, and uh, does it change if you give people more time to learn it. Another one is embedded scenarios. So my, my design style is very much to go back and forth between basic research, and this is fairly, fairly basic to the standpoint of psychophysical, and this is much more uh, application oriented. So you, you, you see the real problems, you try them out, you realize that you've come up against something where you don't know enough about it, so you go back and do more basic stuff, and then you go back and do another prototype, another, another uh, field study, and, and see if your ideas are working any better. So some of the applications that work there, generally in multitasking, multimodal context, mobile haptics, mediated turn-taking in a, in a distributed, collaborative setting, or two that I, will, I could touch on. Shared control of smart systems. And so an example of that is uh, any kind of steering control where you have a smart system and you have, which knows something about your environment and you have yourself and I know what my goals are, I know where I want to go. And somehow, without distracting me, without demanding my attention, without disrupting me, the smart system needs to, needs to share information with me so I can benefit from it and make my decision. And uh, we've done some of this through steering wheel, through throttle pedal for driving. Right now, uh, we're working on a version, uh, again, steering of a wheelchair, in fact, for, for a disabled person. And uh, we're also looking at this concept in terms of expressive control of musical applications, where, again, certain kinds of performance using a digital controller, you're actually trying to make particular kind of sounds that you don't quite know how to make those sounds. The system can actually guide you through, for example, melodic versus amelodic or different, different sorts of uh, musical effects you're trying to achieve so you can push against those 
So there's a, a, a really a, a kind of a continuum between very pragmatic applications like driving and then very creative, expressive applications like creating music that, that uh, share from this, this idea. Music performance and there's also um, tight coupled control with musical applications that's relevant there. And then finally, the questions of what feels good and how do we use, how do we use touch to communicate emotion is, is another big part of what I do. And if there's time, I would like to, to touch on that. Speaking of which. Okay, so start with uh, some touching on the haptic icons part. So first of all, what are they? And uh, they're abstract information that's communicated through your sense of touch, uh, most commonly through vibrotactile signals. And this is something that I've done some work on in a couple of other groups, namely uh, Stephen Brewster at University of Glasgow has, has done some of this and so kind of starting to develop a body of knowledge on how it works. Uh, so they can be embedded in handheld devices, wearable devices, anything that has skin contact, although skin is not all equal. Some skin sites work better than others. Uh, and the ideal is that they're non-intrusive and they don't require screen so that you could, for example, you know, reach into your pocket and get a signal off your cell phone and know who has called or what the call is about and how important it is for you to respond to it rather than just getting a buzz that there was a phone call. You could get a lot more information than that. That would be a very simple example of that. So the research challenges right now on this are making large sets distinguishable, so how you can, for a given display device, how do you make the signals distinguishable? How do you make the icon sets memorable? In other words, if you have a lot of stimuli and you want to assign them to meanings, what's the easiest way to make those connections, make them easy to learn, easy to remember? And then managing salience of these things so that they're appropriately intrusive. You might say that some kinds of signals are more important than others. Some should always intrude, some should not always intrude. And how do you, how do you balance that? Okay, how do you, on top of the other things that you're trying to design into these signals, how do you also control salience? And I will say right now that um, this one's really hard. <laughs> and I haven't made nearly as much progress on it as I feel I've made on these other two. Uh, and I'm, I'm working on trying to find new, new kinds of tools that will, will help with that. So I'm going to jump into a design example now that illustrates uh, both what these might be good for and a way that you could go through trying to systematically design them. So human need, individuals in different locations, so distributed collaboration, they're trying to do a task in real time. And so the scenario we're talking about is that you maybe have a shared screen and you all have a mouse, but there's only one cursor. You have to share the cursor. How are you going to decide whose turn it is? You have a voice link, like, and obviously you could mediate turn taking over the voice link, but maybe you want to use the voice link for something else, more important. Okay? Uh, the state of the art for some time to be is that the software, the software itself is probably not designed for collaborative use, so you have to layer something onto it. So you need some kind of a turn taking protocol, and there's quite a few out there. But most of them don't actually support urgency. They're not graded. They basically, they're on or off. You have to say, I want to take a turn, or I don't want to take a turn. And any, the other problem with them is that they're visual in nature. And since your primary task is visual, that tends to be very intrusive. So you can't really make a gentle request and say, you know, when you have a chance, I'd like to have a turn. But it's not urgent. That's not really one of the affordances of the system. And it really can't be, because the only mediate the only communication channels you have are through the voice which is busy and through the vision which is busy. So anything is going to be intrusive. So there's another modality that we can use if it's in a way that's not distracting and doesn't distract doesn't disrupt your primary task. Okay, so can we use haptics to mediate turn taking? The idea is to reduce load on the user's visual auditory system. At a glance, by at a glance I mean without cognitive effort, a quick look without having to think about it. Display things like the urgency of a request. We're not trying as hard in this particular project to display identification information about the person, although it turns out that would have been nice to do. Just, just how urgent was it? So we've made a turn-taking protocol with a haptic mouse that conveys the user state, confirmation, request urgency. And so basically, well, I'll go on. And this, by the way, is Andrew Chan, who worked on this particular project. So these are some haptic icons to give you a sense of it. So this is our turn-taking protocol on this particular project. Here's, here's the device. It's an immersion, mouse immersion made some haptic devices. This one's slightly modified to have some extra buttons on the side, but basically it's got 
a little eccentric motor that rattles around in there just like your cell phones. It's quite crude. We intentionally used a commodity, a cheap commodity device because we wanted to see what we could accomplish with very minimal hardware that you could buy. Okay, there's seven states here, three kinds, a change in control, uh, degrees of being in control, and if you're waiting for control. Okay, so this was a transition, it has a two-tone buzz. So basically this is what your signal would look like, this is two seconds. So it goes dun dun, or dun dun, this means you are losing control of it. In control, these are continuous ones. If you're in control, if I'm the one who has cursor control, I get a heartbeat. This is if no one is waiting. It's very subtle. I, can, I actually have to try, I have to concentrate. Okay, this is if someone is uh, waiting for control, but it's not urgent. They said by clicking one of these buttons once that uh, I would like a turn when you have a chance. This one means no, that person really wants to participate right now. It's a quite urgent request. And this one was intentionally designed to be quite intrusive, okay? To be annoying, to, to really get your attention. It seemed appropriate to do that. Okay, and then these are waiting for control. So this is what you get if you're in control. This is what you get if you have made a request to be in control. It's very important that if you have inflicted this on someone else, you should know it. <laughs> there should be some feedback to you that you're causing someone else some pain, okay? And this is, this is really quite annoying. Okay, so this would be the corresponding one. Okay, and this one corresponds to this one. I should line them up a little differently there. Okay, so this one is, is gentle. This one is more harsh. It's not as harsh as that one. Okay, so that you don't just forget about it. All right, you're kind of aware. And, you, and the, the, uh, the requester manages them using those little buttons. So there was a question earlier as someone I was talking to about do we do something fancy about you know, conversational analysis to indicate when someone wants control. No, they press a button. Okay, so they have total unambiguous control over it. That was not a variable we were testing. Okay, so we did this setup. So here you have our pseudo setup in a, in a lab where you have four workstations with high barriers. They couldn't actually see each other. They were wearing earphones so that they communicated through the earphones but they couldn't hear except through the earphones so we were logging and controlling all that. They couldn't see each other but they shared a screen and they were just communicating with these haptic mouses, okay? And so we gave them a furniture layout task. This incidentally happened around the time we were moving from our old lab into our new lab so we got a whole bunch of potential layouts for our new lab from this experiment. And, and so the idea was that you gave them an impossible problem they can't possibly solve. There's no actual solvable solution to it. And uh, you gave them different uh, stakeholders. Different stakeholders had different constraints that they owned, and the best solution honored most of the constraints. So it created a situation where they, were, they had a vested interest in collaborating. <coughs> if they left anyone out, they were going to do worse on the solution, so it was important for them to collaborate. That's a particular kind of collaboration. It's not the only kind of collaboration. Okay, we use a modified version of Visio to do that using this mouse. And uh, did an observational study with four groups of four. It was quite a lot of work to do this study. And so we used as perceptually optimized uh, icons, which let me talk about <coughs> perceptual optimization. Uh, seven, seven meanings, seven stimuli associated with seven targets that you saw. Distributed collaborative task observational study, and we compared these situations, haptic only, mediation, so only using those haptic icons, visual only, which we did the most unintrusive version of the pop-up window uh, to request control, immediate control, the state of the art, and then both, where they had both kinds of information available. And then we looked at a whole bunch of stuff, and uh, these are some of, whoops, what happened there? Okay, these are some of the metrics we looked at. Uh, learning how long could they, did they take, so this is actually before we started the study, how long did they take to learn the icons, and the fact was they learned them very quickly. This particular set would take them less than three minutes. The study lasts three hours, and there's evidence that they were accurately retaining these for three hours, so that was good. Inclusion of haptic stimuli, so in the, in this, this, the, the study that had haptic and visual, or just haptic, but either way included haptic, uh, the turn-taking behavior was more equitable. In other words, they, uh, they spent more equal time in control. And we also argued that it improved collaboration dynamics and that there was more turnover, more ready turnover. People didn't hog the mouse, basically. Now, whether that's good or not, you could debate about that. In the context of this particular task, 
it was probably good. But you might have to have other dynamic, other other uh, metrics to measure other kinds of collaboration tasks. But we definitely saw a difference. It, it definitely changed the collaboration dynamics if you had a background channel to communicate with. Okay, so this is an example. This is an example of a kind of uh, study using haptic icons, and it shows how we started with a human problem, and we tried to create a set of icons that worked in this context, and as I'll show next, we actually used some design tools to create the icons to work in an appropriate way in that context. We studied it, we found some things worked, some things we're not so sure about, we have to go back to the drawing board and try again, so it's a quite, a quite user-centered approach to designing this particular but we did get positive results. It's worth going back to continue. Okay, so why is it so hard to design haptic icons? So, anyone want to take a crack at this one? If you have this plus this, and you add them, not serially, but overlaid, superimposed, they're happening at the same time, what is it going to feel like? This one feels like a low frequency buzz. This feels like pop, pop, pop. If you put those together, what are they going to feel like? Does anyone want to give it a try? I got it wrong when I guess, so you don't need to worry about that. Is, it, is, is what I asked make sense? Who thinks it'll feel like a low buzz with pops in it? Yeah, okay. Who thinks it might feel like something else? <laughs> well, okay, we got about 30%. About it feels like something else. <laughs> it feels like this. Okay, these things are completely gone. Any, any idea why? Those of you who guessed right? <laughs> Jim, did you have a... Desensitized? Actually, there's a couple different mechanisms that could happen there. Okay, so this, uh, there's, it could be happening at the machine level. It could be that the machine just can't actually render both of those things level, whatever device you have. It could be happening at your sensory apparatus. There can be masking going on, physiological masking. Okay, it's hard to tell which. Different devices might have a different result, on, at least on the machine side. But the point here is that uh, I thought those were going to be a buzz with pops in them, and they weren't. So my attempt at feed-forward design when I put those together failed. Instead, it's an example of how you really have to iterate a lot. It's very hard to predict because it's a quite complex, quite complex team. Yeah. Excuse me? How high are the peaks? Yeah. Okay, so there's lots of variables. So the question was, high, how high are the peaks? And you're making the point that you know, there's some parameters involved where this might... If this is low enough and these are high enough, perhaps something will go through. So, yes. But the general point is that it's hard to predict. It, it's, hard, it's hard to model that going ahead. But, but no, for sure. parameters where you can feel what you thought Yes, if you make them extreme enough. And also different hardware will have different results. Okay, but it's quite hardware dependent. It's quite parameter dependent. And it's, it's, uh, you could try and model all of that and predict it, but remember there's still the sensory apparatus in your hand that you have to include in that model. And I would say, I am of the opinion that at some point it's not really worth trying anymore. Okay, and it makes more sense to iterate. You know, use some common sense and make, use some heuristics as you learn, but also just count on the fact that you're going to have to run these by people, you're going to have to do the studies, you're going to do the comparisons. You're going to have to test a lot. This was something we were talking about earlier today. It's nice if you can have a combination, but it's actually quite hard to predict a lot of these things. Okay, especially when the hardware changes on you all the time. Okay, and the salience pattern is quite different as well. And especially when you're getting to be quite large sets, um, it gets much more difficult. And you're, trying, you're looking at, I make an adjustment in one signal, and then I find that the other signals, it's now more like this other, I made an adjustment to make it more different from one signal and it made it more like another one and now they're getting confused. It's, it's, really, it's really a complex design problem. So we needed a tool for this. Okay, so uh, two design principles that I have gleaned from all of this is that you need really good prototyping tools of the sort that allow rapid prototyping, rapid iterative prototyping. You need to make the stimuli, feel them, test it on users, and try it again. And this whole cycle needs to be really fast. Okay? And then the second one is that you need to have some you need to have something really good for this block right here, okay? Some kind of an objective perception-based thing where you can quickly determine if you are converging or if you're going far away, a tool that will help you converge. And so uh, I can give you a quick example, run very quickly through a complicated example of one of these, which is, is a technique that I have gotten a lot of mileage out. It has, it has some flaws in it that I'm probably more aware of than anyone, but it's been pretty useful despite that. 
So the, basically the idea here is that we need a visualization tool that helps if you're having a large set of hap haptic icons and you want to see how users are perceiving them as a set, you need some kind of a tool to help you understand how the users are perceiving them. I know how I'm making them. I know what parameters I'm varying in my device. You know, maybe I have a little buzzer and I can control frequency and amplitude of a signal on it. Maybe I'm changing the waveforms and doing something more complex. But I don't understand exactly how people are perceiving that and what their salience patterns are, what levels they can distinguish. I could do lots and lots of J and Ds, but that's, that's too simplistic. It's not giving me the big picture information I need all at once. So, uh, the technique of perceptual multidimensional scaling is something that's been used actually in auditory analysis with the, in the 70s with, uh, to understand timbre space. I see someone nodding back there. And I, got, I was quite inspired that, by that and started using it haptically and then discovered later that some people had already been doing it. Um, Fred Holland's... Mark Holland's... Mark I even got the initial one. Um, was, was doing it years before I, I thought of doing it using naturalistic stimuli. And I started doing it actually using um, synthetic stimuli to help understand how people were organizing uh, the space, and, but actually also to use it as an iterative design tool, which I believe was a, a, a kind of a, a new, new use of it. So since people, who, who knows what MDS is or has a kind of a working hand-waving knowledge of it? Okay, you're about half. So I'll just say really quickly, the, the, the understand it stood as a black box that tool. It's quite simple, and it's not too much more complicated than that underneath. And so supposing you're trying to make a map, a geographical two-dimensional map of where cities are, and what you have as input to your information is you have uh, uh, distances, absolute distances between all the cities. Okay, so you have Calgary, Edmonton, New York, and my favorite, Vancouver. Okay, and you have all the distances between them, uh, but you don't know where the north-south is. These are scalar distances, and you can plug that into an algorithm which does a best fit on it, real, literally, it's just a matrix optimization, and you come out with the relative positions of those cities. You don't have any orientation distance on it, okay, so the map could be rotated, but if you put perfect information into it, it will give you a good map, and you have enough elements in it, it will give you, there's a unique solution to the map. Okay. So that's, that's what uh, perceptual MDS is, if you're trying to find how different, how far apart percept, uh, stimuli are from a perceptual scale, you do basically the same thing. You get the distances between the pairs, and then you, you chug the numbers. But of course, when you have noisy data, and when you don't know the dimensionality of the data, here we know it's two-dimensional and we have perfect measurements, this becomes more of an <coughs> optimization part of the problem, and so that's where some of the, the trickiness comes in. The other hard part is uh, how do you actually collect the distance data, and that's where a lot of the innovation comes in. I'm not going to get into that right now, but I actually don't do paired comparisons to collect the distance data because uh, it takes too long and subjects, uh, they, they lose their point of comparison and their values drift a lot, so we actually do something different than that, and that's another evolution. Okay, so that's MDS. And we actually use that tool to design the stimuli. So just going back again, I'll, I'll show you an example in a moment, uh, to, to uh, recover those, for example, those seven stimuli we used for the turn taking. We compared those seven stimuli, actually we chose them out of a much larger set, did the MDS, found where they were spaced around, and pulled out the stimuli that were far enough apart from each other to maximize the perceptual distance between them. Okay, so that we knew going in that whatever else the stimuli would not be confused with each other, and we felt very confident about that. What was much harder was we didn't know their salience patterns. We didn't know which one would be considered the most salient. And, and actually that really loud, obnoxious one, we had to pull out of that analysis because it actually dominated all the others that it skewed the analysis of the rest of them. So I don't yet have a solution for that because MDS isn't very good at handling uh, large salience differences in the perceptual data. But having them far apart didn't mean you could overlay them. Right? That problem you had with the clicks, the pops on top of the other one doesn't oh. necessarily mean they did overlay, right? It uh, does not necessarily right. mean that at all. Yeah, it just means that individually they're very, they're very distinctive from each other. It's no prediction of how they're going to be added. Okay, so uh, recent updates on this. Uh, we've recently made a distinguishable set size of 84 stimuli, and this is actually displayed using a handheld uh, web device that has a, a piezo-vibrated screen. 
very sensitive. You can have a great dynamic range on this device, but they're very subtle. They're not loud. You can't really feel it distinctively if it's in your pocket. And so we made a set that we can show that people can tell apart 84 different stimuli that are based on rhythms. They actually have a temporal element. And uh, that was David Turns. Associating meanings to stimuli, and there's a question of do we use symbolic versus iconic models? You know, is, is metaphors the best way to go, or can people learn these things abstractly? And that's a quite open question right now, which uh, I would say the metaphorical approach is very attractive and is probably initially easier to learn, but you hit walls very soon as you're trying to go into large sets. So a metaphorical approach is basically if, um, for example, the, the set I showed you on the turn-taking phenomenon, uh, protocol. Those were metaphorical because there was a there was a, a heartbeat metaphor or a PCI card insertion a certain, uh, an insertion uh, metaphor that made it easy for, to learn those. Okay, but what if you just randomly scramble them up and ask people to learn them? How how well can they do at that? And we have some interesting results on that. The problem is when you get in very large sets, it's hard to have these nice metaphors. It, it, it falls apart. Okay, and then a longitudinal study. So this was this 84 stimuli set was about um, creating distinguishable stimuli, but that is not saying that people could actually learn and remember 84 meanings. That's hard. That's much harder. Exactly what does it mean? It means that given any pair of them, you can tell them apart? Yeah. Yeah, it means you can tell them apart consistently. Right. Okay. When, they're, when you see both of them. <laughs> Which is very different than being able to absolutely identify them. Yeah. Very, very different. So this is, this is a, a nice result, but it's got a long ways to go before being usable. Okay. And so the next one that we set that up for is a longitudinal study, which um, I think I'm going to skip over to talk about this instead because I'm going to question. But the longitudinal study was basically, if you give people, they can't, people can't learn 84 icons in a single setting. I, I didn't have to test that. I know, I know that people can learn 10 or 20 in a single setting, but not 84. But if you give them more time and you give them exposure, can they learn more? And so we did. We just kind of did the longitudinal study, where we give uh, about 20 subjects four weeks to learn as many as 84, and we actually found that they they got up into the high 40s in very difficult conditions where they they were testing their learning under strong multitasking situations, and they showed a very interesting learning curve, which is encouraging for further learning. But I'm going to be out of time, so I'm not going to talk about that. It's okay. So I'm, I'm going to move on from, from that part now, anyway. Actually, I'm just going to show you this, this slide real quickly. So this is the, the learning curve, the interesting learning curve for the 84 icon set. So this, is, this data is very, uh, very recent. Actually, so this, just to put it in context, this is what we did. So this is using this handheld Nokia device. We gave them a game of Tetris, okay? They have to use this, they're playing a game of Tetris, which uh, they found very engrossing. And then periodically you get interrupted by a, by a haptic icon, by this tactile signal, sorry. And uh, then you would have to, something with a little pop-up thing would come down here, and it would give you a choice of options, and you had to tell which option that icon represented. Okay, and the options were randomly chosen in addition to the correct option. Okay. The, the start thing was you actually, you actually, a batch consisted of seven icons, so you would learn them in batches of seven, you would learn the batch of seven, and you wouldn't be allowed to proceed into playing the game until you passed a quiz on the batch and showed pretty good performance. Then you would go into the quiz, and you would, you would play, sorry, you'd go into the game, you would play the game for a while, and after you'd answered right on these icons enough times in the game, you would go back and you'd be allowed to take the quiz again, you'd have to pass the quiz again. So we were really rigorously testing learning before allowing you to advance to the next batch. It's a fairly conservative approach. Okay, so hopefully that scenario is good. And they did this for four weeks of doing three or four sessions a week. Okay, and each session would 15 minutes a session. So lots of short exposures. Okay, and this is the results for 15 subjects by batch. So it's the first seven, the second seven, the third seven, and then the next ones. And you can see that actually that there's, some, that, that there's some ways in which you have to be careful. I haven't had a chance to really analyze this data a lot, but you have to be a little bit careful because this, these uh, users, everyone didn't get this far. Everyone didn't learn as many as 40, as, what is that, 42 icons to get out here. Uh, these were the more talented, haptically, haptically gifted uh, uh, users made this far. I would not have made it this far. I would have been like that there. So. Um, 
so, so, so the fact that these are low could mean that the, the people who struggled more are underrepresented in the later data. But everyone did these three, and this is what's really interesting. The first seven were pretty easy. Okay, it didn't take people too long. We knew that people can learn seven icons. We've done that a lot of times. Just one more. Okay, the second one, we asked them to double the number. That was hard. They struggled with that. Everyone struggled with that. Seven more or 14 more? Seven more. So now they, they're, they're working with 14. They're trying to juggle 14 at once. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. And then we gave them another seven. So now they're working with 21. And look what happened. They figured out how to do it. They worked out some kind of a system. And, and our, our, our qualitative data backs this up. So this experiments always have lots of qualitative. We, we talk to our subjects a lot. Okay? And it suddenly got easy. And then after that, you can just keep adding more. It doesn't make any difference. They just keep adding them on. They've learned how to integrate it into their system. So uh, I was hoping to get a little farther than, than, uh, than 42 for the set. I, I was guessing we'd get further. But I have to also say that by the time you get past here, we, we gave these are kind of the easiest ones to tell apart. These are harder to tell apart. And after this, they get really hard to tell apart. So the tasks, the icons that they're asking, we're asking to learn are becoming more and more distinct. So one of the theories I was really pushing on this is, over time with exposure, can you get better at this? Does it get easier for you? Do you learn how to attend to your haptic sense and it gets easy? And the other thing is to remember that this performance is logged while they're doing a distracting primary task. Okay, this is what they're doing when they're under load. And they're performing well in their primary task and this is their secondary task performance. Okay? So, so that was, that was, it was it's showing, and the other thing is that these are totally random association. There's no attempt to put any kind of metaphorical meaning on these. We just pick them out of a hat and put them together without any, any name, okay? A, a rhythm, a rhythm-based set of, set of icons, yeah. So, you started with 15 or ended with 15? 15 subjects. Oh, 15 subjects got this far. We had, uh, so, so, the way you have to look at these blocks, this is a block of seven, seven icons. Right. But, Subjects took variable time to get through a block. Some people work, it's like a self-paced learning program. Some got through faster than others. So at this point, we all 15 got this far. And then you start having a, a dropout rate. Because we ended the test at four weeks. So some people got this far in seven weeks. I think about three or four of the 15 got this far. I, I don't know. I can't remember for sure. And so you, you, you don't have a full data set right and these were the more talented subjects, and that's why so you have to be. If, if these guys, if we instead said, okay, you just keep on hacking at it until you get all the way out to 40, I, I would guess we would see these. This is how many times you had to get a quiz before you. Okay. Sorry, the number of sessions you had. So the remarkable thing is that it's from session this, two to session three. And then that it stays low after that. Well, yeah. but those Although, might be very but talented. These, but these might be more talented. Yeah. yeah. So this is the big jump here. They've, it, and the, the pretty clear thing here is that people have made a system for how to learn. They, they, they've done some cognitive mental organization thing that makes it easier for them to now add more in, which they didn't have there. But this and that effort of creating that mental organization is what we're seeing. So very provocative, you know, have to do a lot more work on it. Yes. So so that inclusion case, how many can you discriminate and how many you can learn? Right? Yes, yes, two different so, questions. So people who fail could fail for either reason. I mean maybe I can discriminate but I cannot remember. Uh -huh. Right? That's right. And, and so we've, we've pretty much shown that pretty much anyone can discriminate these. Okay. And remember, we're feeding them the easier to discriminate ones so earlier. Yeah, so this one is testing remembering. Yes. Okay. Yes. So someone... Yeah. yeah. It was probably the icons a little bit. The icons, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kind of wasn't going to talk about this, and then I got sucked into it, so I skipped that part. So... Uh, this was a whoops, yeah. This was a rhythm-based set. So, so earlier ones we deliberately stayed away from rhythm because it's a very salient element. So, we, you know, the earlier studies I've done, we did frequency and amplitude and things that were kind of uh, uh, similarly salient. Um, we ran out of space on that. We could get up to 30 or 40 using those parameters, but we couldn't really get big. So, we we looked at rhythm, and so this this is a, a kind of uh, somewhat inadequate portrayal of the rhythm. So, there's actually 21 unique rhythms. Here and so we created the, there, there's a very large space of possible rhythms that last two seconds and have a kind of a minimum length, minimum note length based on masking and how, how fast you can actually distinguish them. 
So basically the dark thing is the vibration is on, the white part is the rest, it's turned off. So you can see that these are kind of lots of short notes, these are very long, slow ones. These are mixtures, and then these are kind of doubled, as I recall, the doubled of the other ones. Okay, each of these sequences is played four times, so for a given rhythm, I think this takes half a second, and you would get a two-second stimuli, which consists of playing this one four times. Monotonal, the same frequency. We use frequency as an additional design variable. So to get to 84, we use 21 rhythms, two frequencies, and two amplitudes. And, and a factorial combination. Does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Curious, what's the difference between R2 and R4? What's the difference between R2 and R4? Uh, that's a good question. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> I, I, uh, clearly I have some debugging to do on this display. <laughs> I, I think I took this directly out of the paper, so that's bad. <laughs> Glad you cut that eventually. Okay. Did you, did you randomize the association? Oh yes, they were completely randomized, yeah. Yes? Do you expect to see any differences between, say, musicians and other That's a really good question. It was about musicians versus other kinds. So there's actually a couple of different, over the years of doing all these user studies, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a long answer to your simple question. The simple question is, we didn't look at that for this set. But the long answer is that over doing all these studies, we've often noticed that there's a, a very large difference in the performance that different subjects can deliver. On, for example, these MDS matching, where they're making comments. Some people are able to do really fine discriminations and some people cannot. What's the difference? And so we got into the habit of doing very elaborate profiles on our subjects. We would get lots of background data about them. So when we see what look like outlier performances or just a quite commonly a, a bimodal distribution where you have people who are quite good at one end and then another hump of people who are not so good. It's, it's kind of bizarre. We don't usually see a nice, you know, sigmoid curve. What, what describes, is there any predictor of who's going to be good? And one thing that we saw predictably, I, w I shouldn't say predictably, we quite often saw that people who were in that really talented set, turns out that they would have one of two things, uh, skill at playing a, an acoustic instrument, musical instrument, or they played video games a lot. First person shooter video games. <laughs> it took us a while to narrow it down to the kind of video games and realize that was important. <laughs> so, so there's something going on there. The problem was when I went back and tried to study that explicitly, like I explicitly recruit musicians, or I explicitly recruit gamers and try and compare with them some normal population, which is very hard to find in a university setting on the video game one. Um, <laughs> that I couldn't find this effect, okay? So it's, it's somewhat elusive. I'm not sure I've operationalized it properly. Um, but it does seem, and I firmly believe this from a lot, a lot of anecdotal evidence, is that we can get better. This, this, this large set, uh, study actually seems to be confirming this. You can train yourself. You can get better. And I think that there are certain things that help you get better at it. And I think that some musicians do that. Are, are better at that, have learned to do that better than others. But I think not all musicians, and so I'm having trouble finding it. So I don't know if that helps. Now this one about rhythm, which is different than just making fine tactile distinctions, is a little different. And I have other funny stories about rhythm with that. There was another, uh, not related to this at all, but a different kind of study where we're looking at um, uh, trying, trying to find uh, some support to a musical instrument uh, player. Uh, that was very garbled. Let me try again. One of my PhD students ran a study last year where he was looking at rhythm and ability of different group of subjects to trace rhythm, to follow rhythm patterns. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't matter why, he just was. Okay? And he was trying to run about 20 subjects, and he got about 10 subjects from our usual subject pool, which is uh, UBC undergraduates. And the ones who answer our calls for experiments tend to be of Asian descent. We have a lot of uh, Japanese, Chinese, Korean students at our university, and they tend to be the ones who do in, in our computer science department especially. And then he ran dry on that route, and he couldn't find any more. He's Cuban. He invited his Cuban soccer team to come and do the other 10 versions of it. <laughs> and man, you could not mix that, those two data sets. <laughs> you had, he's Cuban, he's Hispanic, and he created these rhythms in probably not as systematic a way as he might have. And uh, the Japanese students really 
could not reproduce these rhythms. They were hopeless at it. They could not do it. Okay? <laughs> the Cuban students were much better. <laughs> he wasn't looking for that effect. It was not a control. It was a mess. We had to ditch the data. We couldn't use it. But now I want to go back and do this on purpose. <laughs> See if I can actually find that again. Uh, there's a huge cultural difference on the rhythm thing. It makes this, this study a little bit scary because I think that and it's one of the reasons I insisted on randomizing things, because I think if you try and deliberately use musical rhythms, uh, you'll run into big personal differences because people will have different associations for different rhythms. And you bring a lot of stuff to the rhythm, which is very hard to control from the designer standpoint. So I could talk on about the rhythm thing, but I better... Uh, so I'm going to jump way to the end and start scenarios of how studying how people what they use to communicate emotion either to a, to a person, to some kind of a person proxy, but mediated by synthetic haptic feedback, and how does that work? And I, I could give a couple of examples, but I'll just talk about one right now. So I have a, a PhD student, Steve Buchanan, who came to me a few years ago, very interested in um, wondering how people use touch to communicate emotion to other people, and he was quite taken with, with the, the idea of petting a cat, a lap cat, He'd had a, a, a cat who shared his home for a while until they had to kick the cat out because he's very, very allergic to cats. And he really missed having the cat sitting in his lap and petting it. And he thought there was something really important involved in that interaction. But he didn't understand what it was. And he thought it was really sad that he wasn't allowed to have that anymore because of his allergies. And he wondered if there was some possibility of creating that in some kind of a proxy so that you could get some of the, the emotional benefits you get of petting a cat, but even if you couldn't have a cat. And shut-ins, elderly people who are at home alone, kids who are sick in a hospital, all these are, are possible places where this could be of utility. But right now, we really don't know, you know, is it because it doesn't really have to be alive? It's sort of an AI question, really, or is it the kind of the mechanical aspects of touching? Can you separate that out? Can we understand it? No one has studied it in a systematic way. So we set out to study it a little more systematically, and yes, you can get a PhD doing this in computer, a, a viable computer science department. Um, so he built something that we first called the Hapti Cat, although it's been given a different name now. And, and uh, since it's human touch, it can do all these things that are kind of, and it would be helpful if I could switch, Per should have two R's in it. Uh, so, so we intentionally didn't make it look like a cat, but a kind of a fuzzy lap creature. We didn't want to suggest too strongly in a particular animal, because if you did, people would be disappointed when it didn't quite act the way that animal does. Uh, other people have tried to make some of these animatronic creatures that are trying to target a particular creature. But uh, in our case, we wanted an experimental model, and we wanted it very highly instrumented, and we're very focused on the sense of touch rather than how it looks. Okay, and so some of the research questions are, can a user tell how this thing is feeling based on what they feel of it? Can this creature interpret a user's emotional state based on the interaction? So basically, the emotion goes both ways, and can we measure that? Can we, can we create some kind of a model? So the first, the first study, <laughs> we did it with it was really, really quite funny. He did this as a, as a course project in my grad class when we first came to work for me. He, he roped in you know, four other students, to, three other students, to do this project with him. And so we made, anyone, everyone knows what a Wizard of Oz prototype is? A few, few nods. Anyone know who the Wizard of Oz is? <laughs> Am I showing my age? Okay, so a Wizard of Oz prototype is when you want to pretend something has a computer and is highly intelligent in a computer kind of way, but you don't want to take the time to actually build that because that would really be hard and you just want to get a quick answer and decide if it's worth building the thing that you're testing. So. The haptic cat that we're talking about would actually be pretty hard to build in a programmable way to work nicely. But in a couple of weeks, these students could throw together something with uh, a piston to make it breathe and a little you know, hand-driven buzzer to make its ears pop up. And it had a heating pad and you could flick on by hand. So all these things worked, but they required about a team of four people sitting behind a booth to operate it. <laughs> so you do this, you know, I wish I had, they didn't videotape it, it was just criminal. Um, so, so here's the participant, he's sitting there, he's got this thing in his lap, and there's Steve, there's his grass things he's got with him, and he's, he's kind of reaching through and saying, okay, make it happy now, do the, do the program for happy, so they're like pushing the bellows, and they're switching <laughs> up, and they're making his ears poke up and do all these things, and he's calmly asking something, 
so what do you think? Was that, what emotion was that, you know, that it just showed? And then vice versa, show me, show me that you're happy, show it that you're sad, show it that you're angry at it. And then taking notes on all the gestures that it was doing. Okay, and so this is basically it. And then we built version two, which has is actually me mechatronic device. It has lungs and it, its ears pop up and it's got FSRs all over it. And so it was, took him two years to build that. This is a computer science department. Okay, and then and then we're on the third version now. And the idea here is to have a fully uh, actually make an emotion model. So here you have uh, the human side, and here you have the creature side, and here you uh, you have. Basically, you, you take these, these two parts of it in where first you, you measure these together. So basically, you have the creature do something, and you record the person's response. And then you have the person do something, and you sense the FSRs, you sense their touch. You record that response, and then you try and close the loop. You put those together, and you try and see if you can influence the user's response based on what the creature is doing. And that would be some sign of excessive emotion model. Okay, and so we're working on that. That's his PhD thesis. And the current version, which I'm quite proud of, has been spoofed in nature. This is for real. So this showed up in May. It says, in British Columbia, scientists built a therapeutic bunny that responds to petting. And the next step is to design an automaton fueled by lettuce to feed it. It does look kind of like a bunny now. So, um, so this is what it looks like now when we're doing the final studies. And the next step on this, what we're, what we're working on simultaneously, is to build a version of this that we can put in a, a clinical setting, not for shut-ins as we originally thought, but actually to treat kids with anxiety disorder, trying to find a way to teach them to calm themselves down by doing a slow, engaged, patient-requiring interaction where we can actually sense their emotional state and, and make the, the creature be a little coy and require them to um, slow down in order to get the reward of it behaving the way they want it to. So we have a clinical partner and we're working on that and trying to make a, a version of this thing which is safe to give to small children. And uh, I'll tell you where that goes in a little while. And so there's Steve again. And I'm going to stop there. I think I should stop there. Yes, questions? Yes? I have a question about the bunny project. Yeah. I you have to think of the passage in of mice and men, when oh. Lenny pets, what is it, to death? I don't remember. He pets something to death. A mouse. A mouse, mouse. to death. Uh, I don't remember this. I, 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 it's a, it's a dim, distant memory. I'm going to well, have to. So what's striking to me about it is he, he's trying to show love and affection to the uh -huh. mouse, yes. but he kills it. Right. And so. One of those, <laughs> those deeply disturbing incidents. Exactly. <laughs> it just strikes me that people express, um, it's like, understanding how people hug. People hug uh, and they're all trying it's to for yourself. love, but it's a different, they have different yeah. ways of expressing it. So, so. My little boy gives me black eyes when he hugs me. Exactly, that's exactly, <laughs> that's a great point, right, exactly. So, so how to, how to understand how people express, physically express yeah. emotion. And, and the bunny suggests that there's one uniform way of, right. of doing it. Um, Although, no, I, not completely. I mean, when we're trying to form our emotion model, we're not, telling people how to express emotion, we're trying to understand what they do and what they label a particular emotion. Okay, okay. in other okay. words, we're asking them to tell us what the different emotions register to. Got it. Okay. When, the, when the thing does this, what does that mean to you? Okay, you show this particular emotion, you show love to it, you show okay. anger to it. What does that look like? And it's very possible that we will not see the same thing coming from every person. Okay, so that is And we'll have to figure out a way of dealing with that. I don't know how we'll deal with that, but it'll be interesting to know. Right, right, right. right. It might be a personalized model for for this. That's very, what I'm very likely. Yeah. Yeah. We can deal with a personalized model. That's the, that's the joy of it. It can have a different program <laughs> for every right. every little kid who uses it. But then there'll be a, yeah. some kind of response. What you want back is something that matches your expectation. That's right. So it's matching. It's a really a matching. Expectation that's right. Model. And so there might be a, a kind of a calibration that has to happen there. Right. Yeah. But first we have to understand what people. What's the range of what people actually mm -hmm. interpret that? Yeah. But great question. So, okay. Sorry. Think. Do you have a? Hey, it, was, it was kind of a follow-up on that, but okay. I think you just answered it. So okay. My my question was, you, you're sort of doing from the person to the device, or from the device to the user, but it's that contingent response based on what I do and the way that it responds to me. That I think that it's. Is... I, th I think the, the dynamics are going to change a lot as soon as you close the loop. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, okay, so I, I'm going to try and rephrase it and you tell me. So I showed that loop and I said, first we're going to ask the user to express something, then we're going to ask them what they thought the creature expressed, 
And then I'm going to put those together. And what I didn't really say or I glossed over is that I fully expect the dynamics to change a lot at that point. I think that once, if I touch the thing and it's just sitting still, you know, I can show it some emotion and it behaves a particular, it doesn't do anything. But if it responds to me a particular way when I touch it, I'm probably going to change how I touch it. That's, it's, going, it's going to change what I do a lot. Yeah. Uh, initially, it'll probably startle me. That's actually, that's, I, I can tell you stories about that too. But, for another time. But, but so, I think, I think that that was what you were, what yeah, you were it's, asking. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's matching that as a parent. Yeah. When you close the best, you, it has to be yeah. somewhat contingent upon what you were thinking. I, my, my personal opinion is that once Steve gets to the point of making a simple emotion model, um, it's time to bring in another PhD student to then go and explore that more fully. And that will be a whole other PhD project in exactly exploring these parameters. It's, it's, a, it's not going to be simple. Yeah. Yes? In your Excellent experiment, what did subjects self-report uh, during as their cognitive change was you know, change, rather than rate of change? Can you say that again? In your haptic Iconic yeah. experiment, uh -huh. what did subjects self-report as the change in their cognitive strategy. Oh, are you talking about the longitudinal study when when uh, we saw that sharp abrupt drop in uh, in time turning? Um, you're catching me out on this one because this is really new data, and I haven't had a chance to. I I know that that data exists because we are watching really really closely for exactly this kind of thing. Um, what I what I Brad is the student who's done this, and what I've gotten from him so far is that they were reporting that they were finding ways to organize it better. But I don't have a lot more detail than that yet on it. It's questionable whether I should have even shown that data yet. But, but, but yeah, it, it, it seems to be that this qualitative feedback we are getting is consistent with what I said, but there might be more to it that I haven't uncovered yet. Is that answer? Yeah. Is it possible you're just weeding out the poor performers because the later data didn't include people who couldn't the first, the first three, well, that's exactly the caution that I showed for the last three, if I go back to that. Um, I, I have exactly that caution for uh, part of the data, although I, I think there's still, I mean, looking at it, there's still going to be an effect. But um, this data. So what I'm saying is that all the subjects got this far, so I know that I'm not doing, I'm not weeding out any performers. <coughs> the, the worst, the, the most slow performers got this far and showed this kind of drop. And you can see it's a pretty small standard deviation there. Um, it's up here, but I'm not so sure. These, these, when they when they went on to learn the harder blocks, um, like the the, the 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 slowest learners didn't complete this block. So I don't know, and I and I can't tell you offhand. I don't know how many uh, data points are represented in these. So this data is less trustworthy. But and, and, and an open question is if we drag those subjects until they learn all of those, what would this data look like then? And I don't know that. Yes. I missed how the how that's, I know it's delivered through a cell phone, but like where on the hand? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't go over that well enough. I, I glossed over that. So um, let's see if I have a better picture of this device. Okay, so you can see it. This is a web tablet. It's actually not a cell phone, but it's immaterial. You, you, um, it's actually a very good question. You, you interact with it through a stylus. Okay, so you hold it in your hand. And you interact with the stylus, it has a piezo screen, uh, piezo actuators on the screen. You get feedback through your hand and through the stylus. Okay, and it actually makes a difference if you're holding it or not, and that is a fact of this device. Okay, does that, so, and those are the 84 stimuli that they had to learn. This is actually showing them doing the MDS thing where they're testing discriminability on it. Okay, so that gives you a sampling of the work. Um, anyway, so I'll just um, finish there. And with a bunch of the students who have worked on this project, uh, some of whom have moved on, but I'm still talking about their work because it's interesting. And I, I just also wanted to put in my little plug that I'm doing a, uh, an information session for people who might be interested in going to grad school at UBC. We're quite interested in expanding to uh, good design students from a variety of backgrounds like physics and engineering to come to computer science. I'm a case in point, and I often 
I have a lot of grad students coming in who themselves don't have computer science background, so it's, it's possible to make that jump. So anyway, tomorrow afternoon, 4.30 p.m. <coughs> in Tech B211, so please. And if no one wants to talk about grad school, we can just talk more about research and that will be fun too. And there will be pizza. <laughs> so. And these are just some, some of the faculty. These, these are other faculty who are in my group, uh, which is the uh, graphics visualization HCI. And then that's about uh, one-fifth of the computer science department at UBC. We have 54 faculty. It's a pretty big group. And very strong ties with psychology and engineering. Lots of multidisciplinary work. So it's a good place, good place to be for this kind of work. So any other questions about, uh, yes? Why like, why you were Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was shooting for somewhere between 75 and 100. I wanted to make sure I had enough that I wouldn't run out in a longitudinal study. Oh. So I shot for a number that was larger than what I actually thought people could do. Although, in the meantime, we did some other studies, and I was starting to wonder if we had made enough. Uh, the, the 84 basically came up, we came up with 21. We, we did this kind of heuristic-based analysis based on rhythm, and we fairly easily, comfortably got to 21 very distinguishable rhythms and thought that was probably enough because we had two other parameters we could vary and that got us within our, our ballpark range and so we just stopped there. It was kind of, the heuristics we used got us to 21, we quadrupled that and that was a good number. So it's a bit arbitrary, but you know, it, it, it seems to have done its job. So yeah. the limit is on how many we can distinguish, not how many we can remember again. Uh, Depending on which study you're talking about. So the MDS studies where we were trying to, we were specifically testing distinguishability. We tested all 84 on that one. But it only just tested test distinguishability. Okay, and then the second study, the longitudinal study, we used that same set, which we had adjusted a bit based on the MDS study, and tested memorability. And that's the one where you saw some people could get pretty far through it, all the way to 48, and some people didn't get so far. So how many dimensions were in those 84? Yeah, well, I, I luckily, yeah, it's a great plant. I have a lot of information on that. That's exactly the kind of great information that the MDS does reveal. Okay, so, so remember, here's, our, here's our, uh, uh, the rhythm part of our stimuli. In addition to this, we varied uh, frequency and amplitude. So um, here is, I hope that displays pretty well. This is a pretty bright display. So these are all 84 stimuli. So the little numbers represent different stimuli. And you can see a color code over here. So green is short, even notes. Blue is short notes and uneven. Orange is long and even. And gray is long and uneven. Don't worry about that right now. OK, so, so what we got here is you give them all these stimuli, and you run it through the black box, and you get this pattern out. And you're trying to make sense of the pattern. So one of the things that we do to try and understand how people are mentally organizing the stimuli is we color code them based on what we know as designers of the stimuli is different. And then we see if we can deduce anything from that about how the subjects are discriminating them. Like, do they discriminate them <coughs> the same way that we design them, or are they doing something else that we hadn't suspected? And so what we actually see in this case, is that one of the axes was exactly one of our design axes. Okay, so basically blue and orange both are, um, turns out, are both uh, low amplitude. Sorry, no, never mind. Forget the colors, it's just confusing. Okay, most of the high amplitude notes were up there, most of the low amplitude notes were down here. So this point is the centroid of all the low amplitude, which is 50% of the stimuli. This is the centroid as a location of, of all the high amplitude stimuli, which is the other 50% of the stimuli, okay? So we see that very clearly they're making a big distinction based on amplitude. Amplitude is coming through really strong. That was one of our design dis uh, dimensions. Subjects are using it. But then there was this other mess, and, we couldn't, and our design dimensions weren't working for that. And after looking at it, really poring over the data a lot, we figured out that there's a dimension that we had never suspected. We were, there was a dimension that was inherent in the rhythms that we were not aware of. It wasn't one of our heuristics that we had used to design the, the dimensions, which was that they seemed to be doing something, well, there's long, long is over here, and short is over here, but there's this thing about unevenness which seems to be distributed in there. So very regular rhythms versus kind of jerky rhythms, which in hindsight made perfect sense. That, that seems like a logical way to distinguish rhythmic 
was, but it wasn't something that we were using to design them. So the MDS pulled this out. But we were looking at this and thought, can't we do a little bit better? Now the problem with MDS, one of its problems, is that uh, it's really easy to look at two-dimensional solutions, but beyond that, it's really hard to see them because you're, you're looking in three-dimensional space, it gets quite confusing, and it's really awful to show them in a talk. But we have found, um, in the years I've been working with this technique, is that very lucky, luckily, especially when you have a big complex set like this, you can break it down, and you can look at part of it, and you can get a lot of information. One of the things that happens if you have a pretty salient dimension, um, it can suppress real variation that's happening in other dimensions. Okay, And if you look at just the suppressed dimensions, without the salient stuff, it explodes apart. Okay, the More dimensions, and I call it unfolding the dimensions of the space, by relaxing the constraint that's being imposed on the whole MDS uh, dimension. So if you take amplitude out of the picture, which is kind of squashing the response, the two-dimensional response of the others, then what happens is you see this. Long and short, even and even, clear as day, okay? And, and so, so there, this is a three-dimensional data set. It was very hard to see this in a three-dimensional plot, but when you kind of plot half the data set, we saw the same, this is, this is just the high amplitude subset, you get the same pattern if it's just a low amplitude subset. Okay, so, you know, over the years we've learned some tricks you can do, and some tricks you can't do. <laughs> With, with, with this technique to try and get more visibility into the data set. There's another, uh, another MDS solution using a more complex device. Uh, not rhythm, but uh, it was a skin stretch device that I built with Vincent Hayward. And we also had a very, very complex MDS space. And what we found in that, that case that there was dimensions that would apply to a subset of the data, but not to the entire data set. And you had to throw out some of the data and just look at a subset of the data in order to allow those dimensions to be expressed. Uh, and, and so you'd find this greater local dimensionality in the data that wasn't existing in the whole set. So, yeah, there's a lot of information buried in there. But it's hard to calibrate it. That's, a bit, that's my biggest gripe about it. Because you see these things and I say, oh, well, like 37 and 38 are this far apart. Well, what does that mean? You know, how different are they? Are different enough to use in an application? I don't know. So something else is needed to actually take this into usability. It's, it doesn't take you all the way there. Okay. Yes? I'm going to bother everybody with <laughs> So, first of all, congratulations on the Nature publication. <laughs> second, second. <laughs> That's not a publication. Uh, <laughs> we did no work whatsoever for that. So, second is... Uh, have you considered the, the processes of memory consolidation in, in this learning, uh, longitudinal learning? Not, not by that name for sure. Uh, where, is where you're internalizing yeah. something that you're learning, or learning to learn. Uh, right. And, and the, uh, I think that's exactly what's going on in that large set, but I don't really know the tools to talk about it more precisely. Maybe you could. So, but I, the one comment I have is that the literature says that there's a time element to this. So I believe. If, you, if you're given rests, yes. in, or, you know, the inner training intervals are, are large enough, you consolidate, and if you, if you don't have a right, lot of right. Rest, you don't. So this is exactly about why, you, why cramming for exam versus slow learning, and that's exactly why we were doing these short sessions spaced out over time was exactly for that reason. We thought we would get farther than just giving them big, painful sessions, but lots of little short sessions over a long period of time. So it would be interesting to try it again and, mm -hmm. and do cramming and see if you And see if you cram and see what it does, yeah. Should we call it quits? <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs>